Hey folks, it's Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy Dungeon Master Prep. This is a weekly show on Sunday mornings where I uh, talk about D&D and go through the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Tomb of Annihilation game, my, my Sunday game. I have, a, I have a Sunday game at a local game shop and I run games there. Right now we're running Tomb of Annihilation and... Uh, I figured we can go on to Twitch and go through the steps together. Uh, also, we can talk about things going on with D&D. For example, yesterday I ran my uh, yearly, my annual Curse of Strahd, uh, actually uh, my, my Castle Ravenloft game. And uh, we can talk about how that went. It was very interesting and I learned some things. I learned some valuable lessons. Uh, Let's see, I need the chat window. I don't have the chat window. Let's get that open. Open up the chat window. Pop out. I've got the chat window and I'm watching Twitch and all looks good there. So minimize that, move that over there. A lot of windows. I should really get a second monitor. But I got a great big monitor, so. Uh, if you are in chat, say hello. Um, I like to, you know, whatever you wanna talk about, we can talk about. We don't have to stick, I don't have a really formal, big formal agenda. Uh, I'm actually running a little late because I decided at the last minute, you know, it'd be very cool to have a little Dwarven Forge set up for the beginning of this game since I know where they're going to start. And then I started building it and I had to tear apart five rooms that I built for other things and I had to find parts and I'm still missing things and I'm scrambling about. So it's quite a, it's quite a morning. Uh, so I will be leaving at 11 so that I can go finish that up before 1130 before I have to leave for the game. So that's a little stressful, but good stress. D&D stress is good stress. Uh, let's see. This is the 28th. Uh, if you happen to be in chat, say hello. Uh, make sure everything's running smooth. Everything's running smooth. I see nine of you are there. So if you, any of you want to say something or uh, have a little bit of conversation, happy to. Hey, Navy DM is here. I was just writing a thing about you this morning, very early this morning. Uh, you won't see it for a little bit, though. It'll be about a month. Uh, North, and I can't talk about it. North Shore, but I think you know what it's about. Uh, North Shore DM is here. Uh, Tom W. Browning is here. No, it's all good. You sent me a thing. I asked you for a thing. You sent me a thing. And I'm using that thing. So it's all cool. Very cool stuff. That's your uh, abstract combat map thing. Just have a mute when you're coughing. <clears throat> I might have to run upstairs and get water. I forgot my water because I'm scrambling about. It's all crazy today. Uh, so let's see. I think I'll start by talking about my, um, Curse of Strahd, my, I call it Curse of Strahd game, it's Ravenloft game. So, uh, I run a yearly Ravenloft game, sometimes with the same people, sometimes with different people, sometimes with a mix of people. My game yesterday was with my wife and my friends, Chris and Sharon, who have done this before, um, and my friends, Robert and Leslie, who just started playing with us in an irregular game. And, uh, I like to run an abbreviated version of Ravenloft. And in this abbreviated version, I stole ideas from uh, James Intercasso and um, from Jeff Greiner. Uh, Jeff Greiner had the idea that you can still do the drawing of the Taraka deck uh, by having them in the cart on their way to the castle, getting the drawing done. And then as soon as the drawing is done, they're kicked out of the cart in front of Ravenloft and they have to go collect things. Uh, and the thing I stole from James Intercasso is he figured out how to, how to tweak the Taraka deck so that the only way... The only areas that the items can be found are in Castle Ravenloft. So that way, what happens is you have this intro, they're riding to the castle, they're getting the fortune told, the items are placed in the castle, they're dropped off at the castle, and now the whole rest of the game is them trying, trying to find the items before Strahd shows up. Uh, and then Strahd shows up at a specified time that's based on game time. So if you, are, if you have five hours to play or four hours to play... Um, you set the timer for 45 minutes before the end of the session, and that's when Strahd shows up. And you, you let the players know that that's when Strahd shows up. So that way they can scramble around the castle trying to get, you know, collect things um, before, uh, before Strahd uh, shows up. So I've run this, I think, four, I don't know, a bunch of times. I've run it, I've run it many years now, five, four or five years at least. Uh, and maybe longer. And uh, yesterday was the first time I had a TPK. Um, so in this case, uh, we had four characters and my wife played Irina, a warlock whose pact, uh, whose, uh, warlock pact connection was with Strahd. So she wanted to go to the castle and break this pact connection that she had and her powers were sort of, you know, 
loosely coupled to powers a vampire would have, which is very cool. You can actually make a very cool vampiric character with a warlock. Uh, she played a Hexblade warlock. And um, the rest of the characters were there to help her go to the castle and defeat Strahd to, to break her connection. Um, the items were spread out pretty far. The sword was way at the top of the heart tower. And the book was in the throne room on the second floor. And um, the third item, the, the uh, icon of Ravenloft, was found in the tomb. So they had to go literally all the way up and down. So the game was very vertical this time. And in other cases, it was all in the tomb, and they all went down in the tomb. So the cool bit is they've been to chambers and rooms that I don't think I've ever run before. So it's, it's very cool. Um, and uh, they got the sword, and the paladin took the sword. The paladin was played by Robert. And they got the book and destroyed it, which meant that they could kill Strahd regardless of where his coffin was. If they defeat Strahd, he dies regardless of his coffin still being around. This little tweak I have. And then they um, they didn't find out where Strahd was, but it didn't matter because Strahd's always going to come to them. And uh, so they're fighting. They got they got um, kind of duped, not really that far duped, a little bit duped by a couple of. Um, Vistani loyal to Strahd who led them into a room full of wraiths and then they fought the wraiths and then in the middle of the wraith fight I saw that there was like five minutes left on the timer for Strahd to show up so I had the rats show up I had carpets of rats so I think it was like seven swarms of rats showed up and they started biting everybody so they they're just finishing off the wraiths now they got these wrath these rats to deal with car carpets of rats and then Strahd shows up in his hybrid bat form and he is hitting like a freight train. I used my Empowered Strahd, which does a little bit more necrotic damage on a hit, has a little bit more hit points, and a higher AC. He's, he basically cast Mage Armor. So he's like, I think in this case, he had Mage Armor and a ring. So he had an AC of 20. An AC 20 for level 8 characters is actually pretty hard to hit. And he has Shield, but I didn't even bother to use Shield. And he just beat him up. He was all over the place. I figured out that his improved invisibility, if he casts improved invisibility on himself, he's really, really, really hard to get a hold of because he has a stealth of 22 or something. He has a really high stealth too, which means there are times where if he'll use his stealth on top of improved invisibility, you'll never find him. And then you don't find him until he shows up and is beating the crap out of you. So he ended up knocking a bunch of people out. They're healing each other to try to get people back up. And then he cones a cold, the whole, he cone of colds, the whole group with a, a necrotic version of cone of cold that reflavored it a little. And it knocked four out of the five people down. So only one person was left. And it was the cleric of light, a female cleric of light. And he goes to her and says, you know, Irene is not working out. Why don't you become my new my new queen? And you and I together will rule over Ravenloft. And if you agree to this, I will, I will spare your friends. And she is saying like, well, I don't know. Can I think about this? And her hand is inching towards the, 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 the sun sword, which is lying nearby. And... She, he says, you know, sure, think about it as long as you like. And then he goes over and starts killing the other characters. He, he goes for the paladin first and tries to bite him and kill him. And he f misses his attack. He rolled like a five and a six on his attack for his bite. So he, it, the, the paladin was down to two death saves already. So this would have killed the paladin. And he missed, but then she lunges for the sword. And he, him with his perception of 22, sees the fact that she's lunging for the sword and bashes her with one of his... Um, bash attacks and knocks her out and that meant everyone was out and at that point the the situation was over and I said you know Strahd is going to turn you all into his new vampiric thralls and next year you will be facing vampiric versions of yourself so they had a really hard go they fought a lot of tough fights they went straight to the heart and attacked the heart which means four vampire spawns show up so they fought these former vampire adventurers and um that was really tough. So the interesting thing is that like my group, this is, I, I you know, I can't even think of the last time I TPK to your group. I don't TPK people. I, I, it just doesn't happen. I'm very, I don't like it. And I don't like, um, I don't know that my players like, it. I know my wife doesn't like it. That's for sure. She hates it. So the, you know, it was a bit of morose. Like it was like we, everybody got together for a yearly game and they're all kind of like, yeah, wow. Huh? We died. And nobody was like, wow, that was awesome. Some people are like, oh, it was really fun. Yeah. I liked it. But Nobody was really like excited about it like previous years where everybody's very excited about it. So yeah, Navy DM says sometimes the dice simply have their own story to tell. That's fine, but the dice don't have joy. <laughs> the, the, you know, the dice, the dice don't, uh, uh, the dice have no emotions. They don't care whether you cheat or not, where the players do. And, if, you know, they don't care whether the players die or not, but the players do. So um, uh, what I thought about was, like, I played it straight, right? Like, Strahd has a crazy high passive perception. It is, like, 22. 
And he's not going to miss the fact that she's lunging for the sword. But I thought about it. And the interesting thing is I was watching Bram, my wife and I watched Bram Stoker's Dracula beforehand. So I was putting a lot of like the you know imagery from that movie into this, into this scene. And um, what I kind of wish I had done is I wish I just let her grab the sword. And like he's busy trying to kill the paladin and missing and he's trying to chew through the armor. And he just misses the fact that she's got the sunblade. And then she hits him with the sunblade. And he was almost dead. He had like 120, 100, yeah, 119 hit points down. And he only has like 140-ish, you know, because the heart was destroyed. So he doesn't have his normal 200 hit points. And it would have been cool for her to be able to kill Strahd with that one blow or wound him badly. And he shrinks back. And then maybe she gets a chance to heal. And he's, you know, trying to fight. And then have her kind of pull it out with one character left and sort of restore the other ones and let them finish her off. That would have been epic, right? And, and maybe the players would have known that I was pulling the punch. But I don't think they would have cared as much that I pulled the punch for that as they cared as they would care about me staying true to the rules and have everyone get killed. So I do think that like there are situations and this is going to be, you know, I don't, I know that many DMS will have a different view of this than I, um, but I think that like looking at a scene like that and saying, what's the coolest thing that can happen in here is the coolest thing that he kills the party or is the coolest thing that she pulls it off with, you know, with her last attack. And, and I think the latter is cooler. And I think just by ignoring a couple of things like Strahd's passive perception, that, that, that could have ended that way. You know? Or maybe she had, had two or three, instead of having one chance, which was roll on her deception versus passive perception, which she's never going to make, give her a couple of opportunities to be able to do it. I mean, she did have this choice, right? And, and so that was an opportunity where she could say, yes, I will, I will give myself to you to save my friends here. Right. And she didn't. She said, no, she's going to go for trying to finish him off. And, and that's how it worked out. So I'm not story wise. I'm not upset about it, but I am kind of bummed that like this yearly game, people walked away and they weren't. I, I felt like people walked away without as much joy as they could have walked away with it had they won uh, like they have in previous years. In previous years, they fought Strahd and they and they beat him. And I kind of don't know what was different. They improved invisibility was awful. Like not being able to see Strahd and hit him was really, really bad. And even then the Sunblade Ray has disadvantage on attacks. He still, when he's invisible, that negates it. So he can still attack and his attack hits for like 23, 24 points. So a couple hits will drop, will drop people. And he gets five of them around or something like that. So um, do I consider other systems for irregular one-offs? I have, I've run, um, I've run Fate, I'm sure. Uh, and I've run 13th Age before. Um, but like, you know, for this one and for other one-offs, I'll absolutely do it. Um, but for this Ravenloft game, it's like, well, it's Ravenloft. And, you know, fifth, fifth edition fits so well with the theme of, of Ravenloft that, that it works out well. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of a lesson that I picked up yesterday was really look at the situation, especially at the edge of a TPK and say, is the TPK going to be epic? Are people are, are people going to be excited about that uh, as much as they'll be excited about pulling it out? And is there a way to do one over the other? And I just, I think that I know with me and my friends, like I TPK'd, we TPK'd at a game at, at Gen Con and I threw it fit, you know? I was all kinds of pissed off because I felt like we got screwed by the adventure. Um, hi, Sean Merwin. Um, I love Sean. And he and I had a long talk. He ate a big piece of carrot cake while I bitched about his adventure. So, um, you know, I don't like TPKs. I don't like doing them as a DM and I don't like them as a player. And and I think that we talk a lot about it. And I know that's tons of people like TPKs have to happen. Chris Perkins is a big deal. You know, TPKs have to happen. They're part of the, you know, the, if the threat's not there, the game's not there. And I think this is directly relevant to the Tomb of Annihilation game that I'm running now because the tomb is just deadly. And, I, and I'm worried about killing people that have, you know, where they have characters that have been around a long time. Uh, in my Wednesday game, I gave them the opportunity to switch their characters out so that the characters they've been playing for a long time can go do other adventures in Chult while uh, a band of hired mercenaries are the ones that actually go into the tomb. And uh, they said, no, we want our mains to go. I'm like, okay, you know, you're going to hit that Onyx box and it's going to suck. But here we go. So I, I just think like I'm going to play it by the book and I'm going to be one of those DMs that's like, well, that's what the adventure says. And, and, you know, I don't know. So I think I'm going to not do that. I think I'm, my, my lesson that I picked up is I'm going to run them to the tomb and it's going to be hard and maybe somebody will die. But I th have a feeling I'm going to be, I'm going to go easy because I, I like the characters and I like the story that they drive and I want the threat to be there, but I never want them. I don't, I don't, I don't know that a true TPK is as fun as feeling like they, they pulled it out. So. 
so that's a thought. Uh, last week, so my character is now, my, the, the character for my Sunday game, they are deep inside of the tomb. Uh, they are actually now on level four. I accidentally thought it was level three. It turns out it's level four. They are down here, if you look over on the right. Let me make sure my window's up. They are in room 52. Uh, room 52 is uh, the throne room, right? Yeah, so this is the one with the blind artists. And uh, I think there's like a zombie Tyrannosaurus down here, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, lots of interesting things that are going on in this room. So this is a room where I said, I want to build this thing out in Dwarven Forge because I think it'd be really cool. It can have upper platforms and lower platforms. It turned out to be really hard. So <laughs> I'm finishing it up, but it, was, it turned out to be a lot bigger than I, how's my hair? It turned out to be a lot bigger than, my, than I thought. Um, and, uh, so unlike the previous game where they had many different directions they could go in this one, uh, I know where they're going to start, that they are going to start in this chamber. So I can have a nice fun, big encounter in this chamber with a nice big layout and some cool stuff. And that'll be, it'll be a good time. Um, uh, so that's really, this one's easy because the start, and let's see, um, They've already explored this room a little bit, but I might kind of pull back and just remind them. So we're going to keep that. Let's see. Withers Tricks, we keep that. So uh, the only character I think that isn't here today is Warren, although uh, uh, it's possible. I think Wheat Zeline said he wasn't going to be here either. But Ogechi should be there. Um, Punchy, Smoke, Gabriel, Punchy, and Ogechi will be there. So... Group of four. We have uh, Huit Zeline, the player, said that he's probably going to be irregular. And rather than trying to bring in an alternate regularly, I think I'm going to keep it to five because I kind of like five. Um, so uh, the strong start will be the skeleton. They, they know that there's a skeleton that's walking around to the bottom holding a pair of scimitars. What they don't know is that it's going to have more arms and becomes essentially one of those Tomb Guardian not a tomb guardian, but like a uh, skeletal guardian thing. I don't know if they have those in D&D, &D, Fin 5e. Isn't there a forearm skeleton? Or am I thinking of the forearm gargoyle? Um, they call them skeletal tomb guardians in 5e, in 4e. Uh, I don't know. And if you guys in chat happen to know, do you know of a monster? It's an undead monster. Uh, I don't see it. Um, so let me look up uh, Tomb of Horrors. So Compendium, Adventures, uh, Tales of the Yawning Portal, Tomb of Horrors. Oh, well, let's look at creatures. Let's see what they've got. I thought there was a... Um, I guess these are all the monsters for the whole adventure, aren't they? Uh, I'm looking for a four-armed, so the, I guess there's the giant skeleton. Um, yeah, so this one's got the scimitar attacks, but it's huge. Interesting. So I, I think we're going to just make a small version of this. Um, and that's going to be a good you know, a good tough fight. So, and we'll give it one extra attack or maybe we'll give it legendary attacks if it, oh no, three attacks is pretty good, especially if they does 15 damage a hit. But we'll give it one extra attack, four damage is a hit, four four hits. Um, That's pretty tough. That's tougher than the normal Tomb Guardians are. So that's cool. Uh, that's called a giant skeleton in, in the beyond. So that is one of the keys. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do is, so they have the five keys that you need. And the keys in mine are going to get harder and harder as they go until the final one's going to be really tough. So that as they're beating them down, they have to like, you know, the first one was just a normal skeleton. This one's going to be a giant skeleton. Next one might be an undead, you know, undead skeleton or an undead mage of some sort. You know, just maybe a death knight, who knows? Like, but each of the skeletons are going to get to be really, get to be really tough. Uh, so I think that that could be fun. Um, I don't know about the the un, the dinosaur. Um, 
I don't know about another ty zombie Tyrannosaurus. Maybe. Uh, the room's kind of... Uh, my, my, the Dwarven Forge version of my room is smaller. Uh, it's too small. So maybe I'll have the statues turn into flame skulls. That'll also shake up the dude who has read the or played the adventure. And so he knows what they are. So uh, flame skull statues. Uh, what scenes might take place? Oh, so they met Withers. That was fun. They learned that they should not be spending a whole lot of time um, hanging out in... Um, the back channel, the back chambers, right? There's a lot of like all these like secret chambers back here. Um, you know, spiral staircase 26, uh, that those are used by the people repairing the tomb and wither. They met withers and they didn't, it, it, they were thinking of attacking him. And withers was like asking him like, how did you do? They, I think somebody brought up in the chat, like give us, you know, on a survey, please tell us how has your experience in the tomb of the nine gods been, you know, from, from, too easy to oh my god horrible i wish i you know with a one on one to five and peaceful to horrendous and you know they filled it out and it was very funny and then he's like well thank you very much you know i must ask you to leave the chamber and please return to the normal journey and you know oh and mine he's a lich because i love liches and you know he I, I, yeah i just can never have enough liches it'd be my third lich in this adventure um <laughs> and uh uh, so that is a, that was fun. And they know like, like they're on borrowed time. They know that the little crawling hands are his. So they're trying to avoid being seen by those crawling hands. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I don't know what direction they're going to head again. And I think like, I'm not going to worry too much about it. I'll, I'll kind of figure it out as I go. I know that 52 and 53 are the rooms with a scepter. There's a scepter sitting on the throne. And there's lots of like false traps in this one, which I like. Like, you know, who picks up that scepter is going to die, you know. But it turns out the scepter doesn't do anything at all. Um, oh, it looks like there's another tomb. 55 is nearby. They might end up with 55. Let's take a look at that. Uh, 55. Rolling Doom. Oh, yeah. The Granite Ball. Oh, wow. <laughs> Unk. Unk's Tomb. I have one character in my Wednesday game. My wife's character is a huge fan of Unk and wants to become his avatar, so she'll be very interested in bringing Unk. Uh, minotaur bones. Oh, minotaur, 10 minotaur skeletons. And they're no, they're no pushovers, are they? Yeah. I mean, they're not huge. CR2 is not, not giant. It occurs to me that, you know, if one had the time, one could, I mean, this one's a really complicated, uh, oh, robo scintillating colors. That's good. Um, and what does Unk's animal form give them? Whoops. Uh, Unk. Oh, constitution of 23. Unk is a good one. Um... So, uh, hey, I, I did forget something. Let's talk, uh, let's do a quick review of the steps. So I've been kind of doing it already, but let's do a quick review of the steps of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Uh, I was wondering, like, man, it's only 10.30 and I'm already like figuring things out. Why? Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about Return. Let's put up a nice uh, map. Get the nice D&D &D map up there. Uh, there we go. Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. By the way, last week, if you happen to miss it, uh, last week we went through the entire uh, Lazy DM's workbook. Since then, I received the cover proof from Eric, um, uh, uh, Eric Nowak, who's doing the full design, and it looked great. There was a couple of minor tweaks. I asked for a new tagline underneath it, and um, we're still getting the uh, PDF format size right. I want to make sure like the careful balance between file size and um map size and i know some people like don't care about how big the file size are is but the devices that we look at it on um it's very memory dependent so pdfs that are too big take a long time to render and they're really hard to like scroll through a preview or anything like that so we want to keep it to like 20 megs 
Um, 20 megs is still pretty big. I think this one's only like three. Uh, this one's pretty small. Um, this is the, the workbook over here. And the problem is like when you, um, you know, when you go into detail on the map, you lose a lot of resolution. It doesn't look nearly as good. So I want the maps to look good. Um, that's important to me. Um, trying to get the right size here. Um, so we're figuring that out. Uh, and that should be out in PDF pretty soon. And I'm, I'm the good news on that one is the print copy should be much easier. Well, those famous last words should be, hopefully will be easier. Let me move my camera just a tad. There we go. Um, uh, I moved it too much. Whatever. Uh, should be much easier than the book, uh, the hard copy version of the return to the lazy dungeon master because it doesn't have a spine. So the only trick with that one is we have to make sure it stays 48 pages. And that means cutting out the uh, fill-in pages in the print version. But that's okay, because no one wants to fill in the print version anyway. And you can download the, the, the fill-in pages and print them yourself. So cutting those pages out and cutting the description of those pages out of the workbook means it stays to 48 pages, which means it could be staple-bound. And since it's staple-bound, that means there's no spine. And since there's no spine, that means there's no spine issues. So um, I'm hoping that that will be easier. I keep your fingers crossed that that will be easier. Um, in the meantime, um, the PDF will be out and the PDF will be really useful, I think. Although that that is a book. I think people, some some folks said this, um, maybe it was Jen Gagne who said that this is definitely one where you want the print version um, because it, the whole point is to have a reference on hand that you can take with you. And, and I think that's true. I, I know that I will want a print version very badly. Um, where return is people like the print version very much and are very eager. I'm getting lots of email from people saying, where the hell is the print version? And um, I know people like a physical version, but that's one that you can put on like an iPad and read and, and enjoy or read on a screen or, or however. And you don't, it's not really a reference. Like, you know, it's not the kind of thing you go back to every time you game. Although, you know, maybe, maybe you do. I don't know. Um, what was my point about all that? So that's where the Lazy DM workbook stands. Uh, and return, the big blow we had this week was I got back the um, the proof of that, the second soft cover proof, and we still have spine issues. So um, I we you know both myself and uh, Mark Radel, the designer, worked on it again. The problem is there's a lot of float in the printer, and like three of them, I printed 15, 14 copies. Three of them came out just fine, and then 11 of them had a big uh, piece of the back cover about, um, let me measure it out to a 16th of an inch of the back cover was on the spine and the whole spine was kind of shoved over to the right. So we moved the text a little bit further to the left and I made the spine much bigger. So, um, worst case, and this is likely the spine will bleed to the back cover, but that is far more palatable to me than the back cover bleeding over to the spine. The spine should be black. Um, and if it's over, you know, if there's a little black strip along the back cover, I don't know that anybody's going to. Frankly, I gave four copies of it away yesterday to my friends. And I'm going to give another five copies away to my friends. And I'm going to tell them, like, something's wrong with this book. And I'm not telling you what. And I want you to tell me what it is. And, like, yesterday, nobody noticed that the spine was a problem. So <laughs> I'm hoping people don't care that much. But, I, you know, they certainly won't care. It's definitely noticeable when the back cover is bleeding over to the spine. I, I'm hoping it is far less noticeable if the spine bleeds over to the back cover. Um, I don't, I don't think that that's going to be a big issue. So I should have, I, I, you know, the cycle is a big two week pain in the ass cycle. And I, you know, sent the new cover proof yesterday. Um, it's business, you know, they're on business schedule. So they're, they're Monday through Friday operation, which means it doesn't get to the printer and get set until, uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. And then I order it and I probably won't get it until next week, week after next because it takes shipping, printing and shipping is a five day business, you know, five business day process. So this whole thing is a pain in the ass. And meanwhile, I get a bunch of people email me saying, Hey, where's the print copy? And when's it going to be out? And I'm like, you know, it might've been out two weeks ago, but it's not. So it's, you know, it takes two weeks to figure it out. And I want to get it right. At least this part. The good news is I've been through this book many times and I'm not seeing anything else that's wrong. So the only issue is the spine. And once the spine is fixed, uh, I think we will be good to go. Um, and I'll probably, yeah, but we, yeah, just got to keep testing it. That's, that's, you know, I want it, I want it to be right. You guys are paying money for it. People are paying, you know, somewhere in the order of $5 and 30, but people already paid for it on Kickstarter. And then people are paying, you know, about five fifty for the print copy. And then $12, I think it's going to be 12 bucks. 
uh, if you're buying it without having back the Kickstarter and I don't want people to buy a $12 book and be like, what the hell's wrong with this spine? You know, amateurs, even though we are amateurs, I'm an amateur. Uh, so the steps of Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master. Um, going back to the introduction of this show, this show is about going through the steps of the Lazy Dungeon Master while I prepare for my Tomb of Annihilation game. Uh, there are eight steps in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. You can find these in the preview. Uh, they are, it is linked. If you're on Twitch, you can see it below. If you're on YouTube watching this, check out the description and inside the description, you will see uh, a preview and the preview contains a chapter uh, that discusses the eight steps of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. So you can look at those even before buying the book. You should buy the book anyway, but that's beside the point. Uh, so we call that the Lazy Dungeon Master's Checklist. That's this chapter two right here. And the checklist consists of eight steps. And those eight steps are review the characters. Uh, take a look at the characters that are going to be playing. Pull on their character backgrounds. Understand how those backgrounds tie into the game. Um, you know, use that stuff to, to uh, help fill out the details of the game so that the characters see how things are relevant to them. I did that yesterday by two of the characters had ties to Rahadin, who is um, Strahd's uh, like ma major, major domo. And uh, they came up with backstories that included like corrupted elves and trents and stuff like that. And another one said, my family was killed by Strahd. And I said, actually, you were killed by Rahadin. Rah you know, her, her, she was a monk and her school had been destroyed by somebody. And the, the person who destroyed her school was Rahadin. So she wanted to get revenge against Rahadin. Um, so that's how you tug on the character. You know, that's a, you review the characters so that you have them in mind. And then when you're building the rest of your campaign or best, rest of your adventure, they're firm in your mind. Where is the game going to start? The strong start. Um, what is going to grab their attention, tell them you're in D&D &D, and they're going to see, ah, we got to do something. And this could be everything from seeing a meteor in the sky crashing to the ground to a great party taking place at, um, in, you know, at the, at the local monastery. Uh, it could be, you know, something that happens that either directly involves the characters or that the characters witness. Something's got to grab them and pull them into the game. Uh, oftentimes it's a fight. You can't go wrong by saying, you know, it's a, it's a blustery day, rain is pouring in from the side, you're walking down the trail when all of a sudden an arrow slams into the ground and you hear a voice in Goblin say, you know, give us the chalice, we know you have it. And then you guys are like, what the hell, we don't have a chalice? And then you're, next thing you know, you're fighting goblins. And now you're like, what's this chalice about, right? And now you got a hole. There it is, an adventure, right? Goblins are seeking a chalice. They thought you had it, you don't. Now who does and what, what, why do they give a damn? Uh, outline the potential scenes. This is a feel good, more so than the other steps. This is really a feel good step of sometimes we just want to know that we have some structure to our game so that we feel prepared and you know, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Um, if you can outline, you know, it's a very loose outline and you need to be prepared to throw it away. Um, because the game is going to go in whatever direction the game goes. So, um, uh, but keeping that structure, uh, can, can be helpful. This is also one that is probably the first one that you could probably eliminate. Uh, if you want to cut down the steps to something less than eight. Define secrets and clues. This is the most important step. Well, I keep saying that, but strong start is really important too. Next to the strong start, or par parallel to the strong start, the um, secrets and clues are a really important uh, way to define what is happening in the game and uh, what matters to the characters. So a secret and clue is like a tweet-sized piece of information. It could be lore, it could be plot, a plot twist, it could be background information, it could be all kinds of things. But essentially you write down something that the characters are gonna discover. And the key is you don't write down how they're going to discover it. It's abstract from its place of discovery. So you know that these are things that they could uncover, but you don't know where or why. And, and, and the reason is the game is dynamic. So this is when, when you think about like preparing to improvise, this is a way that you can wire the game into your brain and be prepared to improvise when the game is going on. You know, things that will get discovered, you don't know how. Uh, develop fantastic locations. If you're not running a published adventure, uh, you want backdrops for the game. Where are some, what are some interesting places the characters can go to and explore? Is there an old ruin of a dark monastery on a hill? Is there a crashed airship in the side of a mountain? Uh, is there a giant um, world-eating machine that is half stuck between the nine hells and the prime plane? You know, what are the backdrops that are interesting and, that, you know, awe-inspiring, you know, awesome, like from the real de definition of the word awesome. Th things that will make the players go, wow, we don't have that in real life. 
Um, and often to outline it, you just describe it with a name and then a few aspects. What are the thing? What are the features that it has that that the characters will be interested in? Uh, outline important NPCs. If you have NPCs that are going to show up in the game and you need to remember them, uh, this is the time to write them down. What's their name, and maybe tie them to a notable uh, and a notable character from fiction, so that you can say like, ah, this is uh, like Al. You know, I always use Al Swearingen, so let's pick somebody else. Um, uh, Van Hel Van Helsing, right? Van Helsing from Bram Stoker's Dracula. You know, so we're gonna have a. There's a monster hunter who's out there, and he has the mannerisms of Van Helsing. Uh, he's a little crazy. He's very smart, and doesn't have great social skills. You know, he's kind of wild. Um, you know, so um, we do that when we have NPCs we need to remember. Oftentimes, we're just gonna improvise the NPCs as we go. Uh, choose relevant monsters. What monsters make sense for the situation? As you saw, I said I want a forearm skeleton. That's gonna be tough. So um, uh, you only need the monsters that you, you can't come up with on the fly, but if you've got some ideas of the types of monsters that are gonna be in a particular area, uh, you wanna sort of review these ahead of time. In particular, read the monster book to say what's the ecology of these monsters and why do they matter and how can I, how can I use that story? Don't worry about the stat blocks and challenge ratings. Worry more about the lore of the monster. Um, and the last step is uh, selecting magic items. Uh, what magic items might the characters uncover that will matter to them? Um, magic items matter very much to players. I had a big, ar not argument, but a, a, a discussion about magic items in my Ravenloft game yesterday because I told them eighth level characters with one magic item each. And they were like, one magic item? That's crazy. Like if we were adventurers, we'd be laden with, laden with magic items. I'm like, mm, you probably have two, maybe. So they obviously matter and people really feel like they are a big part of the character, um, but they are also under direct control of the DM. So um, uh, uh, so it's worth our time to think about what kind of magic items the characters are gonna want. So those are the eight steps. Um, when running a published adventure and depending on the place in that published adventure, we don't have to do a lot of these. So uh, when we look at, we'll return we'll back to, again, if you wanna see all of these uh, you can see them all in the um, preview, the, 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 the Lazy DM, the Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master preview. Uh, so we will return to our notes here. So the reality is uh, when we think about what steps we need to do for what steps I need to do for the tomb, I don't have much. I do want to review the characters, you know, Smoke, uh, who, and it matters a little less because not only does it matter things uh, don't matter that much when I'm running a published adventure, but now I'm in the Tomb of the Nine Gods. So like character-driven stories, they don't really happen that often in here. So it's worth still reviewing them, but I'm not expecting that there's gonna be a lot of tugging on the character backgrounds in this one. So in this one, I'm just gonna move them all so they're in order. Smoke is our tabaxi rogue, uh, ranger rogue. Um, and he uh, definitely an adventure type and happy to explore and um, was tied to Bag of Nails, Hooded Lantern, and Copper Bell, but they're now they're gone. Everything's locked in. Gabriel Tharmon has a definite connection to this place. He's the one that's getting visions all over the place of the um, the Sown Sisters and other stuff because his soul is already in the Soulmonger. They actually pulled it out, and he knows they're doing something with his soul, and they don't know what. But because Gabriel and Tharmon are tied together, um, Tharmond is having visions of what's going on with Gabriel's soul, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Punchy is another character. Uh, he's he's possessed by Zugtamoy, so he's got all kinds of plant stuff going on in him. And everyone's like, what the hell's wrong with you? And what they now have realized is that Punchy's dead. Punchy died fighting the King of Feathers. And now this new thing is sort of a manifestation of Punchy created by mold and fungus and vines and, and plant stuff um, and possessed by Zugtamoy. And now they finally said like, oh, he still has the, 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 he's holding the idol of Zugtamoy. Uh, Ogechi is the uh, shadow magic sorcerer warlock who has a tie to the Ashodo and the Night Serpent. That comes out, that had a big place in Omu, but not as much of a big place in the tomb. Um, so we'll see what connections in the tomb. So those are the four characters I expect to be there today. Uh, the strong start is they're going to see the skeleton with the four arms and the scimitars. And it's going to break, he's going to sort of evolve and break and have two more arms. And I think he's going to be able to teleport too. I think he can misty step. You know, we're going to have like a bony, misty step so that he can get up to that upper platform and start beating the crap out of people if uh, uh, if they start blasting him with spells. Uh, I think I will worry less. So what scenes might take place? The problem is they could go and 
this dungeon is very, very non-linear. They can go all over. So I, I don't know that I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what rooms they went to. Like if we look at last week's notes, uh, which is what I've got here. And if you recall, I had to put all of this together in a very short period of time. You know, the Tumblr room was one, uh, you know, all of level five. Uh, oh, these were the trouble areas. That's not where they ended up. Um, so I didn't really even spell it out, I don't think, right? All I had was this, the Dark Elf Tomb Guardian with the Necrotic dam Daggers. I really need my Tomb Guardian generator. The funny thing is I'm, I am i don't have it handy. And uh, I got to, if I remember, between that and set up my Dwarven Forge and pack it and getting out of here. It'd be nice if my Tomb Guardian generator, if I could put that online somewhere so that I could use it at least if I'm not publishing it yet. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about scenes. Um, I'll just put a big nah. I'm not going to worry about scenes. Uh, secrets and clues. All right, I'm cheating again. I'm stealing secrets and clues from last week. Uh, I really love this one. The whole dungeon is operating from a giant chain being pulled from the plane of Mechanus. That is awesome. Like one of the things I think is really cool for dungeons is why they work. How do they work? And magic, you know, just saying magic is kind of lame. A, a system is neat. And I love, you know, my, my two big ones were fire and water. Um, work smarter, not harder. Yeah, but cheating, when I say cheating, what I mean is like, to me, there's value in coming up with 10 new secrets and clues every time. It's valuable to rack your brain for them and not just steal them from last week. Um, so I'm cheating myself, you know? It's kind of like not exercising, right? Like you're not gonna get in shape by not exercising, um, which I don't do either, I take walks. So uh, the whole dungeon operates on a chain pull from Mechanist. Yeah, so if you have a dungeon, I'll, uh, here's, a, here's a tip, and I, I have this in an article on Sly Flourish too. For, for a dungeon that's not quite as extreme as this one. Um, yeah, but sometimes you do get that really juicy secret that you want to hold on to. I'm, yeah, I'm sure all these secrets are really good. And actually, I'll pull out the ones that they already know. Um, like, I don't need this one. The Withers, Withers was that one. When, oh, so, okay, we'll, we'll go through another exercise. But let me finish my dungeon thought. If you have a dungeon that is not this crazy, super hyper magical place like the Tomb of the Nine Gods, but you want another one that's got like lots of moving parts, secret doors and traps and everything. Two ways that I think, two, two mechanisms that exist um, that can generate that, maybe three. One is fire and one is water. That And water is probably the easier one. Like, you know, water, having like a waterfall or an underground stream or some kind of major, um, you know, major uh, source, heavy source of water means that you can have all sorts of gears and water wheels and all kinds of, you know, bucket levers and everything that can make the dungeon move and live because the water is constantly powering it, right? Um, and we use water all the time in real life for, for power. Uh, air is, I guess, another, but, you know, I think there was a dungeon in Dark Sun that used air. It had giant windmills that sort of powered all the internal mechanisms. So you could do something like that with air. Um, and then fire, heat, you know, um, heat can, can create steam and steam can go through pipes and, you know, it can generate all kinds of stuff. So fire is another vehicle, another energy source for creating a dungeon that really moves and lives. And then the third, you know, gravity is, is one where big weights and counterweights, I always love to describe the huge counterweights behind the wall. So like when a, when a big heavy door opens, well, what, what force moved the door? Well, a giant behind the wall, a giant weight was dropped and that weight, dropped slowly and open the doors or same thing with traps you hear a big wheel behind the thing that's spins up and when it does you know something happens so um uh you don't have to describe it in detail you don't need a working system but you want to describe enough that they go ah so that's this place is operating because water is flowing through it you know that's cool so the idea that there's a huge chain that's being pulled through the tomb of the nine gods from Mechanus, and that the chain's energy is what's keeping this dungeon moving and living. That I think is a, a fantastic, you know, it's way more flavorful than um, magic, you know, uh, or even the original tomb, right? Well, there's demons that get summoned and clean things up. This one has that too, right? This one has the the the, the whites, the um, the albino dwarf whites that, that go and kind of fix things up for for Withers and company. It's a pretty living place. Uh, I did describe that the two, okay, so which, here's the exercise, which secrets got exposed last game? Uh, the tomb is ageless, uh, got exposed. 
Uh, the albino dwarves white sew pieces of adventures together that got exposed. Withers wants uh, to know how the dungeon is working out. That He doesn't want to kill the PCs. He wants the tomb to do it. Yes. They don't know about the skull key remains. Dungeon is much more deadly the deeper they go. I don't know if they know that. Um, they don't know about the Sun sisters and their, and their spies. Um, this one did not come up either, but I don't think that's particularly interesting. The idea that Withers wants to be apprentice to a Sarak. Um, and I don't think they know about the fact that the possessions can be pulled out. So four, four-ish of the 10 secrets got revealed last game. Um, and that leaves five from the last one um these are all good ones we'll keep those but so this gives us an opportunity to not cheat a little bit and come up with five more secrets um the dungeon is deadlier we know that uh what what is there anything about the uh the trickster gods that could be particularly interesting um any any other they already know the trickster gods very well um I think that like the whole, this one I've done before. Indecision, fear, uncertainty, um, hostility, uh, pain, and death. Right, the idea it wants to torment people, um, and it get the, the the energy that it pulls off of people. It's not just souls of adventures it wants. It wants their their pain and their agony. It lives off of that. Um, what other what other interesting secrets uh, do we have here? Um, well, let's so let's put that on hold for a second. Look at the other one. So fantastic locations. Um, this is another one. Uh, so we're going to go easy on this one. We don't have any fantastic locations we have to describe. Uh, monsters, we have the, uh, we have the giant skeleton. We have flame skulls. Um, magic items or whatever. Uh, whatever's in the adventure. NPCs, whatever's in the adventure. I don't think I have any special NPCs they're going to meet. Fantastic location is whatever's in the adventure. Scenes, whatever's in the adventure. So as you can see, like I really stripped the checklist down to characters, the strong start, um, secrets and clues, and a little bit of monsters and everything else I don't I don't need. So that's you know the checklist is all inclusive, but you can strip it down quite a bit. And I think like if you just say characters, strong start, and secrets and clues. Um, I think that that is a, uh, you know, I think my chapter on the refined checklist focuses on um, the strong start, fantastic locations, and, and secrets and clues. But you can pick, you know, the two or three. You could probably go, I think I've done it before. It's strong start and secrets and clues, you know, maybe the only thing you really need to prep an adventure and then you can go. Um, oh, another interesting thing about Ravenloft last night, and then uh, Navy DM, this could be interesting to you. Um, I ran the entire thing Theater of the Mind, so much so that we never even pulled out miniatures for the characters that they played. Um, one of the one of the players uh, that I play with is blind, and um, uh, but we still typically have used miniatures to describe things so that everyone else can get a general idea of where things are. And yesterday I didn't use anything. I did draw real rough, you know, names of monsters, and then the kind of the which characters are connected to which monsters. I think for the whites we did that. I still did the describe an interesting physical characteristic of the monster you're fighting. I think that's a super. I use those all the time. A couple of tips that like I I sort of grabbed onto and then have run with for years now. Um, describe an in, describe an interesting physical characteristic of the monster you're fighting. Uh, he's got, you know, uh, he, he's got his head is elongated or whatever, you know, through the whites. Uh, and then describe a killing blow. And both of those really get people kind of into the story. It really those, I think those are value. I've put them in my tips for um, running theater of the mind combat, and I think that they are really valuable for that um, because they really show the importance of the story. Uh, Oh, I need four more, four more secrets. Let's squeeze the brain. Oh, I've got five minutes to come up with four secrets. What interesting stuff is going on in the tomb? Um, uh, hey, Tilda DeWild is here. Welcome. 
Uh, oh, I think I've said it before, but I was, uh, Uh, a couple for Sarak that his tomb, his attention is not on the tomb, and that his Sarak is so powerful, he's exploring all over the place. Uh, uh, a Sarak is a seeker of magic, uh, is a big one, right? That's these are all sort of motivations for a Sarak. Um, so withers can't see certain areas of the tomb and those are the ones that are safe to take rest and otherwise he's going to dick with you uh, as you try to take rests inside the tomb and uh, withers is known so crawling claws are withers and then you've got little toys, ants, and small terriers, or small, like, hairless, you know, skinless dogs. Um, yeah. Uh, so... I think we have our secrets and clues. I think we have everything we need. I am going to grab that and I'm going to mail it to myself so I have it because I often forget. Um, <laughs> I put that I always. <laughs> it is. I, I don't know if other people end up with the same way I do, but I don't really reference my notes very much um, when I. Uh, uh, I don't reference really much what I um, what I send. So I, I often often this experience of just spending the time to think about it is is what I really need. Uh, Yash Tuki, which tools are you referring to? If you're referring to the text editor, that is Sublime. You can find notes about it in um, the notes uh, on YouTube if you want. Uh, they are you know also in the read reader over here. Um, so I have hit 11 o'clock. I am going to go finish getting ready for my game, mostly in prepping all that Dwarven Forge nonsense because I already started and now I want to use it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. N N Navy DM, thank you for all the chat and thank you for your help with that, um, uh, uh, with the Theater of the Mind uh, map thing that you put together. That was really cool. Thanks to everybody else who came by and chat. And uh, thanks to all of you watching on YouTube. And I will see you guys next week. Have a great, have a great week and hopefully get some gaming in. Take care.